However you look at it, 2019 has been an absolutely huge year for climate change, and for many, it's starting to feel like a turning point. Now, of course, a huge part of that has been down to just one name, and that name is Climate Adam. Obviously, I'm just kidding. That name is someone you might have heard of called Greta Thunberg. Now, uh, Greta just gave her address to the climate negotiations COP25 in Spain um, today at the time that I'm recording this. And it's hard to re remember that at about this time last year, uh, very few people had heard of her. In fact, it was at her speech at the COP24 negotiations uh, this time last year um, that she started to become a little better known. So I thought now was as good a time as any to reflect on uh, the year of Greta Thunberg. Now there have been so many think pieces and analyses of Greta herself, her background, um, her history, her style, why she's become so popular. Um, so I, I don't necessarily want to get into all of that, but I am someone who has worked in one way or another on climate change for the best part of a decade. Firstly, through my doctorate in atmospheric physics at the University of Oxford, and then through working as a climate change journalist and communicator. Um, so I would like to re-watch some clips of her speeches and tell you how they have affected me, what they've meant to me based on my previous experience, and maybe also delve a little bit into the science behind some of her statements. Now, just a heads up, this video is going to be a little longer than usual, um, so I'm gonna put some timestamps somewhere below so you can keep track and um, jump around for various um, speeches from Greta. Um, I'm also gonna provide links so you can watch the full speeches because I'm just gonna be um, showing and commenting on some short clips, otherwise this would be a very long video. Um, and without further ado, let's jump in and watch our first speech from the last year, which is actually from more than a year ago. It's from October last year, when the school strike had already been underway for a little bit. And it's from a speech that Greta gave in Helsinki. And I remember it's the first time that I came across her and uh, properly and, and saw her speaking. There are no rules to keep that oil in the ground. So we can't save the world by playing by the rules, because the rules have to change. Everything needs to change, and it has to start today. So I remember watching this and thinking, you know, like, wow, look at that crowd. It's really exciting that they're so engaged. Um, you know, this is a great new movement. I also remember thinking, um, I had a bit of deja vu, you know, um, because I've seen so many climate movements come and go in the past, including movements led by young people, some incredible movements, um, some incredibly successful movements, including young people taking their own governments to court. Um, so a big part of me just thought like, okay, well, um, you know, climate nerds like me are going to be talking about this for a couple of months then it's going to fade away and we'll all go back to being very depressed. Um, that wasn't the case at all, because in a couple of months' time after that, uh, Greta Thunberg addressed um, the climate negotiations in Poland, um, and this is how that went down. My name is Greta Thunberg. I am 15 years old and I'm from Sweden. You are not mature enough to tell it like it is. Even that burden you leave to us children. I remember watching this speech and, well, I don't need to remember because I'm feeling it right now. I'm actually genuinely getting slight goosebumps because so, for so long the way we have framed um, at, like demanding action on climate change is we need to do it for our children, we need to, to, to protect our children. Um, but here is a young person using the first person, saying, us children, you're leaving it to us children, um, and just making it personal in that way. It, it was something that I couldn't, you know, the directness of it was something so stark and um, new in how we talk about climate action. You say you love your children above all else, and yet you're stealing their future in front of their very eyes. I mean, you can't say it much more bluntly than that. And you have to remember, she is talking at the climate negotiations. This is the place where negotiators from the, around the world meet up 
and um, try to act on climate change. But it's also the 24th climate negotiations, COP24, and global emissions are still going up. So it's hard to see where the lie is in her statement. Until you start focusing on what needs to be done, rather than it's what is politically possible, there is no hope. Again, just a really straightforward way of stating the reality. So often we say, okay, well, here's what we need to limit global warming to, but, you know, this is what realistically we can do given, you know, um, the constraints of politics and things like that. And she's just really saying starkly that to, to say we need to choose that instead of this um, is to really um, put the world in a terrible amount of peril. We have come here to let you know that change is coming, whether you like it or not. The real power belongs to the people. Thank you. So, you know, that really was a speech which um, resonated with me in a way that I don't think a, a climate change speech had before, but at the same time, I didn't really think that much would come of it. And I had good reason to think that, you know. Um, I actually bumped into Greta at the um, climate negotiations, just like walking past each other in the corridor. She wasn't, you know, getting mobbed by press like she would be today. Um, and, um, you know, after I came back and came to the UK, um, and told people that I'd been at the climate negotiations, they said, oh my God, did you meet David Attenborough? And I'd say, no, but I met Greta Thunberg. And they'd say, who, who, who is that? Who are you talking about? So it still definitely felt like, okay, this is exciting for people who are climate nerds, but maybe that's about it. Then just a few weeks later, Greta Thunberg addressed the World Economic Forum. Although she definitely wasn't the celebrity she um, is now, she was already one of the most famous people at this event and one of the people that uh, everyone wanted to speak to. Um, and here's the address that she gave there. According to the IPCC, we are less than 12 years away from not being able to undo our mistakes. So this is um, talking about limiting global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius, which is um, the ambitious target of the Paris climate deal. Um, I don't, so what we mean by undo our mistakes there, if it's suggesting that we'd, um, if we pass 1.5 degrees, we're inevitably going to have tipping points, we don't know that to be true. If we're talking about um, some of the impacts of climate change being very hard to go back on, I, I, there is a lot of truth to that, you know. Um, if, uh, if we wipe out the, the world's coral reefs or low-lying um, island nations are inundated and the people have to move away from them, um, you know, those are things that are very hard to do. Um, so for me, that statement is, is slightly ambiguous, but I think there is a way that it, it does make sense consistent with the science. In that time, unprecedented changes in all aspects of society needs to have taken place including a reduction of our CO2 emissions by at least 50%. If we want to uh, limit global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius, and that is a very good idea, then what she says um, at this point is exactly right. Nor does it include tipping points or feedback loops, like the extreme powerful methane gas being released from the thawing Arctic permafrost. So when I first watched this, I was quite sceptical. So, I mean, definitely some feedbacks um, and some feedbacks which could lead to tipping points are included in the models that we use to, um, to try and work out these, um, these carbon budgets, um, these limits on how much we can emit. Um, and so I was like, oh, what do you mean that, you know, it doesn't include these things? Well, looking into it a bit deeper, actually, for this video, um, it seems like um, some feedbacks um, aren't yet able to be included in a lot of models, and that includes the melting of frozen ground, which could release methane. Um, it includes certain ice sheet processes, um, and these feedbacks can contribute to the possibility of tipping points. So actually, there is a lot of truth in this statement. The main solution, however, is so simple that even a small child can understand it. We have to stop the emissions of greenhouse gases. I mean, yes. That's it. That is the solution. Either we prevent a 1.5 degree of warming or we don't. 
So, I mean, while that's true, I personally don't like that kind of binary narrative about climate change, either this or this. There isn't a precise point, 1.5 degrees, 2 degrees, whatever, where climate change goes from fine to disaster. It's always becoming more and more and more of a disaster the hotter the world gets. And so for me, uh, drawing this sharp, sharp line, I, I don't, it's not how I like to frame climate change. I don't think it's that helpful. People are not aware that there is such a thing as a carbon budget and just how incredibly small that remaining carbon budget is. And that needs to change today. I think that's really true. Um, for so long when I've spoken about climate change, people have kind of said, OK, what do we need to lower um, carbon emissions to? in order to stop global warming. And there isn't this understanding that actually, as long as we're emitting any carbon dioxide, the world will still be uh, warming. Um, and so, you know, we need to like limit total carbon dioxide emissions, this carbon dioxide budget, as much as we can, if we're going to limit global warming. We must change almost everything in our current societies. Again, I think this is really true. Um, we often just think about power plants and things like that, but almost every aspect of our societies, be that transport, what we eat, are implicated in greenhouse gas emissions. Adults keep saying, we owe it to the young people to give them hope. But I don't want your hope. I don't want you to be hopeful. I want you to panic. I want you to feel the fear I feel every day. And then I want you to act. I want you to act as if you would in a crisis. I want you to act as if the house was on fire. Because it is. So, I, I mean, now those words really resonate with everyone because, uh, you know, she's been so quoted on that. But for me, the, the thing which really resonates is not the line about the house on fire, because it is, it's this line about hope, because that really turns the narrative we have about climate change on its head. For so long, um, a lot of people talking about climate change, myself included, have really emphasised the need for hopeful narratives and saying, oh, if we don't um, provide mess any message of hope, then, you know, no one's going to act and, you know, we have to be positive. Um, and actually what we've seen this last year is talking about the severity of the situation and how scary things are and this language of panic is incredibly motivating and I think that we, we've seen a real shift. I'm not saying we shouldn't have any message of hope but certainly we're seeing um, that that's not the only message um, that resonates with people on climate change. Okay, now we jump to September of this year and things have changed a lot. By this point, we've had climate strikes in every continent of the world, millions of young people taken to the street. Greta Thunberg is one of the most well-known names in the Western world, um, and she's in America to give this address. Uh, all eyes on her. This is all wrong. I shouldn't be up here. I should be back in school on the other side of the ocean. Yet you all come to us young people for hope. How dare you? So just immediately I find it incredible, this, this narrative that is starting to form that Greta is some kind of oracle that, you know, everyone has to look to her um, for solutions. Straight off the bat, she's just like, what are you talking about? Um, really interesting. You have stolen my dreams and my childhood with your empty words. And yet, I'm one of the lucky ones. People are suffering. People are dying. Entire ecosystems are collapsing. We are in the beginning of a mass extinction. And all you can talk about is money and fairy tales of eternal economic growth. How dare you? So still watching that um, really, really resonates with me. And um, I mean, at the time, I and many other people really, really focused on the words, how dare you, because they just really ask what the hell we're doing. Um, and some people rightly pointed out, uh, you know, in the same um, little clip, she's saying, um, 
people are suffering, people are dying um, you know, at the, the beginning of this mass extinction. I guess for me, as a climate scientist, those are the things I know and I've heard before. Um, and this sounds depressing, but those aren't the words that surprise me. Um, the words that surprise me are, how dare you? And I suppose that just shows what, what situation we're in, where we know that um, uh, our changing climate is killing people, and that's not a surprise, and yet we're still not doing anything. For more than 30 years, the science has been crystal clear. So, yeah, for, I mean, for a long time we've understood the greenhouse effect, we've understood um, that the world will warm, um, and understood quite well by how much it will warm um, if we keep emitting greenhouse gases. Um, of course, over the last 30 years, the consequences of that um, have become clearer and clearer um, as, uh, as we've looked into it. And, um, yeah, uh, we've got a very clear picture of how dire things would be if we don't turn things around now. How dare you continue to look away and come here saying that you're doing enough when the politics and solutions needed are still nowhere in sight? I mean, for me, this really resonates because um, so often just the process of negotiations just ticks along. But the reality is that even if all the, you know, all the policies that um, governments have um, offered are put in place, that takes us to warming of three degrees Celsius above pre-industrial temperatures, uh, which is well above um, what the world has agreed we should safely limit global warming to. So there's just this huge disconnect between policy and uh, where the policy sh should be. The popular idea of cutting our emissions in half in 10 years only gives us a 50% chance of staying below 1.5 degrees and the risk of setting off irreversible chain reactions beyond human control. So um, she's really cl clearly stated um, exactly what um, the carbon budget means when we say, you, you might have heard this headline, we've got 12 years to save the world and Greta's really clearly uh, stating there um, what that actually means. Um, and also here she's a lot clearer when she um, references tipping point because she says the risk of setting off these um, reactions beyond our control, which I think is um, much better language. The hotter the world gets, the bigger the risk gets of um, passing a tipping point. They also rely on my generation sucking hundreds of billions of tons of your CO2 out of the air with technologies that barely exist. So this last point is something that is incredibly important and is often not discussed. If we're going to limit global warming to, to 2 degrees or the more ambitious target of 1.5 degrees, it's really, really hard to see how we can do that just by um, cutting emissions. It seems almost certain that we'd need to remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. Now you might be thinking, oh, well, how do we remove huge amounts of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere? And that's a very good question. We really um, don't have solutions that can work at the kind of scales that would be required yet. I mean, hopefully we will do, but it, it's something that we're relying on appearing that we just don't, don't know if it'll work yet. There will not be any solutions or plans presented in line with these figures here today because these numbers are too uncomfortable and you are still not mature enough to tell it like it is. I mean, this is just a really uh, strong way of putting the point. I mean, the world agrees to limit global warming to a particular amount and then just doesn't set out its homework for how to do that. I mean, what can you call that other than immature? And if you choose to fail us, I say we will never forgive you. W We will not let you get away with this. Right here, right now, is where we draw the line. The world is waking up. And change is coming, whether you like it or not. Thank you. So, so differently to when I saw um, Greta's speeches before, when she finishes by saying, um, you know, the world is waking up, change is coming, whether you like it or not. 
I think I and many other people now hearing those words start to think, I mean, that seems to be true. Millions of people taken to the streets to demand climate action. If this isn't a sign of change, I don't know what is. Um, and now we come to um, this year's climate negotiations, which are happening right now. They started last week and they carry on for two weeks. This is the 25th climate negotiations. And to start off with, um, Greta's main appearances have been uh, to pass the mic to other groups. Um, I've mentioned um, at the beginning that Greta is far from um, the first person to raise her voice um, on the need for climate action. And many of the voices that have been raised um, historically have been the people who've been hit hardest um, by the impacts of climate change, be they people in, um, in uh, the global south or indigenous communities. And um, Greta used an event a couple of days ago um, to draw attention to those voices. Um, and here's some of the people she brought to the stage with her. The Marshall Islands contribution to climate change is only 0.00001% of the world's emissions. People are dying. Indigenous land defenders are being murdered. The climate crisis is a spiritual crisis for our entire world. Which type of storm or what flavor of floods must Africa test for us to get climate justice? Now, for me, hearing these voices is so, so important. Um, we will all be affected by climate change, but we will not all be affected by climate change equally. And there are some people, uh, thanks to the inequalities of the world and thanks to the nature of the world's climate, who will be hit the hardest and yet have contributed the least. Um, I, I was thinking about making a video just about this panel conversation, but to be honest, I don't quite know what I can add to it. But instead, I really, really um, encourage you um, to check it out. I've, I've provided a link so you can watch, um, watch it in its entirety. It, it's half an hour and I think it's really, really worth your time. Now, two days after that, Greta gave an address uh, to the climate negotiations herself. Um, and, uh, you know, the context is incredibly different from this time last year. All eyes on her. Um, but also her speech was very different uh, to this time last year. It didn't have as many of those incredibly memorable phrases that we've heard previously, and there was a reason for that. Those phrases are all that people focus on. They don't remember the facts, the very reason why I say those things in the first place. We no longer have time to leave out the science. So I find that really interesting having, um, you know, that very first speech we saw in Helsinki was quite just like statistics based. And then we've had some really like personal humanizing um, talks. And now it's kind of a return to the, the information we need to talk about. For about a year, I have been constantly talking about our rapidly declining carbon budgets over and over again. And it is so important to this idea that we have a limited amount of carbon dioxide we can, we can emit ever if we're to stay under particular temperature limits is really vital for people to understand. So it's great that she is talking about it so much. With today's emissions levels, that remaining budget will be gone within about eight years. Richer countries need to do their fair share and get down to real zero emissions much faster and then help poorer countries do the same. So th that's a really um, important thing to emphasize. So we know the world needs to get to net zero carbon dioxide emissions around the middle of the century if we're to stay under 1.5 degrees Celsius of global warming. So that means the entire world not emitting carbon dioxide in the middle of the century. But of course, um, if, um, if the rich nations are aiming for 2050, then what hope do the poor nations have of achieving a target, anything like that? So if we're going to achieve that globally, the rich nations need to be even more ambitious than that. Every fraction of a degree matters. Now, for me, this is just such a fundamental point. 
every little bit of warming matters. The more the world warms, the worse it gets. Um, for me, that is a really useful um, way of framing things. For me, that isn't an exact cutoff point. Um, and I think that little snippet resonates personally with me a lot. So please tell me, how do you react to these numbers without feeling at least some level of panic? I mean, that is a question that I have asked myself and I have asked many other climate scientists over and over again. And, um, you know, I think most people who work on climate change, who work on climate science, um, feel really scared and overwhelmed. And, um, you know, I, I think the people who know the most about it are the most scared of it. And that's, that's a worrying situation to be in. People are ready for change. And that is the hope because we have democracy. And democracy is happening all the time, not just on election day, but every second and every hour. So this is, um, I think, a point that the last year has brought home like no other. And that is that um, people can influence politics um, all the time. The amount, the, the size of the shift we've had in the, in the conversation about climate change, thanks to uh, the climate strike movement, thanks to um, other organisations protesting on climate change, even without elections on the horizon, um, has, has been huge. So this idea that people can influence their politics throughout their lives, not just at elections, I think, you know, people are starting to believe that. We do not have to wait. We can start the change right now. We, the people. Thank you. So yeah, I think um, that's something that people are really starting to feel and starting to believe that raising their voices um, can make a difference on climate change. Um, so, uh, and, and immediately after this, um, this address, uh, the Fridays for Future movement um, took to the stage in, in protest for the failure of the climate negotiations. So, I mean, where, where are we today? Where are we heading? Do I feel more hopeful than I did a year ago? Well, in some ways, yeah. Um, everyone is now talking about climate change. For so long, it wasn't just something we weren't doing anything about. It was also something people didn't care about, weren't talking about. And if they cared about it, they felt they couldn't talk about it. We couldn't be further from that place today. So on the one hand, that gives me immense hope for how much action we could likely see on climate change. But on the other hand, uh, if we look at what has actually happened, the one thing that matters, uh, global emissions, they've gone up instead of going down in 2019, um, according to the current estimates. Um, we're still heading in the wrong direction. So for the moment, I feel closer to how Greta advises. I feel closer to panic than to hope. But the thing that gives me a great deal of hope and is thanks to Greta and young people around the world, um, and I'll, I'll list many in the description below because this really isn't just a movement of one person and it isn't a movement that was just started by one person. But what does give me hope is that politicians are increasingly realising that they can't just ignore this issue. Um, you're seeing politicians around the world at least posturing on the issue, even if not taking real action. And incredibly, the momentum of the movement doesn't seem to be slowing down after this time. It seems to be growing louder and louder. And with that in mind, how will you add your voice to the conversation and help these emissions go from rising to falling like they need to. Thanks a lot for watching and sticking around all the way to the end. I have a much shorter but very important video coming out incredibly soon. So if you don't want to miss that, do make sure that you are subscribed. Until next time, bye. Right now, right here.